my impressions of Hemingway go up and down with each particular work, but I find myself drawn to him every summer. He is a great writer to come to in the summertime. He, uh, so many of his great, uh, great works take place in summer, in warm weather, and he has a great sensibility for the feeling of being hot, honestly. Uh, and, and that can be a lot of fun to read. He has a wide swath of work. Some people say that, well, he always wrote the same stuff. And yes, there's a obvious uh, continuity with, uh, with some of his characters and situations. But within that, he deals uh, with some fairly rich and nuanced material that is um, enlightening, that is touching in many ways. One of my favorites is the relatively long short story, uh, Big Two-Hearted River. It's not really a novella. It's longer than his average short stories, which actually tended to be fairly brief. But Big Two-Hearted River is uh, a, <clears throat> uh, it, it's a wonderful little portrait of a man in a kind of uh, spiritual crisis. And this is uh, completely um, up to the reader to discern. This story takes part in what, uh, what the modernist tradition of what has become known as the iceberg theory. You only, in that the iceberg, you only see a little bit up on the surface, but the momentous stuff is all down below. When you see that little tip on the surface, you're supposed to intuit that everything else is just below the surface uh and this is that you can read this whole story and put it down and go what the hell was that nothing happened a guy went camping it's great uh and you can read it on that level and it's still pretty good honestly the uh the writing is spectacular and i can't read it without wanting to go camping myself quite frankly but with little suggestions, little hints, little things he dwells on, the noticing that this character does suggests the below the surface momentous iceberg. And that's really where the richness lies. You can appreciate it for all of the surface uh, writing. There is spectacular writing in here. Um, but the suggestion, the implication, is all subterranean. It starts off, he, uh, his character, Nick, is going off uh, camping in Michigan, as Hemingway heroes tend to do. They tend to be named Nick. Um, well, Nick was a continuous name, if not character, for, uh, for most of his short stories, and is clearly the Hemingway stand-in. He didn't write, he, he wasn't known for a lot of different characters. But he's going camping and he's going alone. And just understanding that and remembering that and wondering, like, why uh, is kind of important. And you have to remember the purpose or the, the setting, really, the time period here is just following World War I. Hemingway was a volunteer uh, if, uh, in World War I. He saw some action. He was wounded. And he came back, a, uh, like so many others, a very changed person. World War I was a huge uh, mechanized war, trench warfare, and machine guns and tear gas and all of that stuff uh, damaged an entire generation of young men. And Hemingway has a, Hemingway has a share in that. And he gives voice to that. So Nick, this guy who is going camping, is going camping after the war. You never hear about the war, but you have to remember that because it is put front and center below the surface. The second paragraph, after he's pulling up on the train, he gets out and 
the character looks across. Nick looked at the burnt over stretch of hillside where he had expected to find the scattered houses of the town and then walked down the railroad track to the bridge over the river. The river was there, it swirled against the log spiles of the bridge. Nick looked down into the clear brown water colored from the pebbly bottom and watched the trout keeping themselves steady in the current with wavering fins. As he watched them, he changed their positions by quick angles, only to hold steady in the fast water again. Nick watched them a long time. Uh, it, uh, it might be an unexceptional little uh, paragraph in any other context. You can see this easily in a fishing magazine, quite frankly. Uh, you know, outdoor magazine. Um, <clears throat> but that first line of the paragraph looked out over the burnt over stretch of hillside. Now this is a hillside that had just apparently there had been a wildfire go through and so yeah there's a lot of uh, devastation from it. But why include that in this story? What is relevant of that? Relevant enough so that it is the second paragraph in the story right up at the beginning. Well when do you see, when would a young man in the 1920s have recently seen a burnt over hillside? Oh boy. Okay. And when he looks at the fish, he sees them uh, watching the cow, keeping themselves steady in the current with wavering fins, keeping themselves steady. Steadiness is a key Hemingway virtue, and they are against, they are facing against the current trying to hold their ground as the current flows past them and they're trying not to get swept away. Um, it's not hard to make that leap to this is kind of like soldiering. This is somebody trying to keep steady in the face of fear, in the face of battle. Um, he watched them as they change, position, change their positions by quick angles only to hold steady in the water in the fast water again. So he's seeing them changing and running around and then just coming back and holding steady in a different context when the conditions change. Um, again, this is, this is kind of warfare that says he watched them a long time. It dwells on that. A simple, simple action that you can pass over really quickly, but well, okay, what is going on there? And you notice it just says he stood there and watched. It doesn't say what he was thinking about. We're not given a lot of insight into what's going on in there because we can only see the surface. We can only see what is visible, the iceberg tip. And we see his actions. Everything else is below the surface. Everything else we have to intuit from his behaviors, from his actions. And once you start down that road, it's, uh, it's really quite rich. It's really quite... Um, harrowing. The, uh, <clears throat> he goes, he continues on, he goes walking through the woods, he, uh, he sets up camp, he makes himself a meal. All of this is reported in very simple matter-of-fact terms. You don't hear a lot of fancy vocabulary. There aren't uh, particularly expressive verbs in any of Hemingway. Hemingway likes the verb to be, and so you see one and again, once and again, the word was, simple, he was this, he did this, he was that, um, it was this way. Very simple, nondescript verbs. He's writing with nouns and verbs. The sentences are all very short and compact, but they're not elaborate. We're given the barest minimum of information that we have to interpret. And that hint, because of the terseness, because of the, uh, the lack of information that they're providing, they are suggesting more meaning underneath. There is more power in understatement especially when done by somebody like Hemingway. He draws the reader in and suggests, well, okay, what is going on here? And what does that mean? 
he <clears throat> he does all these simple actions. We're not given a lot of uh, uh, we're not given a lot of insight into his thoughts. He sees nobody. We uh, there is no social interaction. Uh, he speaks out loud to himself. I think once in the in, in the beginning. Um, <clears throat> And, and all of the normal means of conveying a character uh, through dialogue or through, uh, through other characters, um, I, the reader is given no access to. We're just seeing him do one thing after the other in a very quiet, deliberate, um, automatic way sometimes deliberate and automatic or contradictory I know but he's going through the motions he does everything very simply his actions are all very uh, elemental walking through the woods setting up camp making dinner over the fire setting up his bed all very simple not particularly plot driven you're not given a sense of okay this is building to something it's just what he's doing but he's doing this for a reason and you have to figure out what it is within that however there's a sense that by doing what he's doing by doing all of these explicit simple tasks, one after the other after the other. He doesn't sit still at all, really. <clears throat> He's not doing something else. He's not dealing with something else. He's not talking about something else. He's not thinking about something else. He is avoiding something else by doing all these little tasks. When you have something you don't want to deal with, <clears throat> Very often, you create tasks for yourself. You keep yourself busy. You keep your mind occupied. You have other stuff to do so that you don't have to do what you don't want to do. And this slowly seeps out. <clears throat> after, after he has dinner, and I love, I love reading about when he makes dinners I, or, or eats in any way, I always want to go and eat exactly what he's eating uh, in the same way because it just sounds so good. Uh, not always the healthiest diet, but and certainly not when it comes to the drinking. But um, he makes he appreciates it on such a fundamental, elemental level that uh, you just can't help but be seduced by it. But afterwards, he's had dinner, he's relaxing. <clears throat> He makes, a, uh, he makes a pot of coffee over the fire, which sounds really cool. Uh, he has a can of apricots that he eats for dessert. He carries an awful lot of heavy stuff, as other campers will note. Like, well, you know, uh, it, walking through the woods would be a lot easier if you weren't carrying all of this canned stuff. Uh, cans and jars, like, what, what are you doing? Uh, but, okay. Uh, but after dinner and after dessert, the coffee boiled as he watched. The lid came up and the coffee and grounds ran down the side of the pot. Simple actions. Nick took it off the grill. It was a triumph for Hopkins. He put sugar in the empty apricot cup and poured out some of his coffee out to cool. It was too hot to pour and he used his hat to hold the handle of the coffee pot. He would, not let this, he would not let it steep in the pot at all, not the first cup. It should be straight Hopkins all the way. Hop deserved that. He was a very serious coffee drinker. He was a, the most serious man Nick had ever known. Not heavy, serious. That was a long time ago. Hopkins spoke without moving his lips. He had played polo. He made millions of dollars in Texas. He had borrowed car fare to go to Chicago. When the wire came that his first big well had come in, oil millionaire, new money. He could have wired for money. That would have been too slow. They called Hop's girl the blonde Venus. Hop did not mind because she was not his real girl. Hop said very confidently that none of them would make fun of his real girl. 
He was right. Hopkins went away when the telegram came. That was on the Black River. It took eight days for the telegram to reach him. Hopkins gave away his 22 caliber Colt <clears throat> automatic pistol to Nick. He gave his camera to Bill. It was, it was to remember him always by. They were all going fishing again next summer. The hophead was rich. He would, get, he would get a yacht, and they would all cruise along the north shore of Lake Superior. He was excited but serious. He said goodbye, and all felt bad. It broke up the trip. They never saw Hopkins again. That was a long time ago on the Black River. Now, there's an awful lot in here that uh, Hemingway uh, detractors can go crazy with. Uh, the, you know, the, the male camaraderie, the presence of firearm, uh, the guys, guys, uh, going fishing and hanging out, uh, you know, coffee the way it's supposed to be, uh, all of these strong macho, uh, terms in here, but this significantly, this little passage, which comes right before the first break, there, there's part one and part two, right before the end of part one this comes and it's the first time you really get to see this character socializing uh it's not a lot but he has a friend evidently he has two there's at least two other uh two other guys in his life there's an implication that there are more but there's hop and some other guy named bill and they all used to hang out and go fishing together and go camping together and they're not there now they lost somehow. They never saw Hopkins again. And you get the sense that, well, if they're really good friends, why? Um, could Hopkins have gone to the war? Could he have been lost? Did he just drift off like a lot of friends, especially when they come into a whole lot of money? Um, I don't know. But it's a loss. You get a sense that he is appreciating that. He's remembering a time. Nick is the narrator when there were other people in his life when he was one of a group when it was camaraderie and friendship and laughter and togetherness and that's all gone now why is he thinking about that at this moment he's just having a cup of coffee we're not let into too many thoughts along the way why are we let into this thought missing people loss it's it's a sad little moment. Um, the story ends with, or the, the first part ends with him finishing his coffee cup, uh, setting up his bed uh, inside a tent, killing a mosquito inside a tent. These are all very basic camping things. If, you know, anybody who goes camping knows that mosquitoes are a big issue, uh, depending on the climate, bugs in general, but there's nothing particularly exceptional about that. But again, the sense of deliberate, simple actions that he's going through and attending to so that he doesn't have to pay attention to what's really bothering him. And what's really bothering him, as this is coming right after this little uh, soliloquy he goes off on, mental internal dialogue or internal monologue about his lost friend. When he starts to dwell on loss, he turns away and he focuses on simple actions, the taste of the coffee, the uh, tasks of setting up your bed, of creating a pillow by rolling your shoes inside your pants, uh, little things, killing a bug with a, uh, with a match and appreciating the sound, the hiss that it makes when you put the mosquito or you put the match to the mosquito um it's uh focus on little things <clears throat> in the morning he gets up there's a wonderful scene where he goes and he just collects grasshoppers as he's uh, uh, uh and uh for uh, for fly fishing uh for fishing rather for bait uh, he uh he he makes breakfast I make pancakes, and, and again, I really want to eat pancakes over an open fire after I read that. Um, just the man in nature and 
experiencing it and enjoying it. He uh, he makes a uh, he makes himself lunch for later on. He's planning ahead. He makes an onion sandwich, which you know this is the benefit of being all alone. You can eat onions raw, and eh, nobody's gonna complain about your breath. And and then he goes fishing, and he uh, he, he he wanders out into the water. He feels the uh, the the current pulling against him as he's standing in the uh, as he's standing in the water, uh, fly fishing and trying and hauling in trout, and putting the trout in a bag and doing all of this stuff, all of these simple little tasks that he's done so many other times before, but he's doing them very deliberately and just focusing on these actions and not anything else, except one thing keeps intruding on him. He's as he's standing there in the water, he keeps glancing up at this one little area that he doesn't want to go fishing in. It's a swampy area. It's overgrown. It is uh, dark. And he's avoiding it. And it's conspicuous, like, well, you know, okay, why? But why are we being told about this? If he doesn't want to fish there, fine. What's it to me? Who do, uh, what do I care? He's got a lot of fish already. He seems to be doing well. Why am I being told again and again that he doesn't want to go over there? Well, what's he avoiding? Nick did not want to go in there now. He felt the reaction against the deep wading with the water deepening under him, uh, uh, deepening up under his armpits to hook big trout in places impossible to land them. In the swamp, the banks were bare. The big cedars came together overhead. The sun did not come through except in patches. In the fast, deep water, in the half light, the fishing would be tragic. In the swamp, fishing was a tragic adventure. Nick did not want it. He did not want to go down the stream any further today. simple sentences. But notice the repetition. He felt a reaction against the deep wading in the water deepening up under his armpits. That's two uses of the word deep, but just within this sentence, how many times does he imply deepness? Like, okay, an, an editor today would probably come and say, no, 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 no. You say it's deep. That's enough. Move it on. But he says, no, he did not want to go in there now. He felt a reaction against the deep wading with the water deepening under up under his armpits to hook big trout in places impossible to land them. Deep, deep, deep. Okay, I get it. It's deep. In the swamp, the banks were bare. The big cedars came together overhead. The sun did not come through except in pa patches. In the fast, deep water, in the half light, the fishing would be tragic. Deep and dark. We're told repeatedly that it's dark. Dark. Uh, the, the, the banks were bare. The big cedars came together overhead. It's one way of saying it's dark. The sun did not come through. Another way of saying it's dark. Uh, except in patches. A third way of implying or emphasizing that it is dark. Uh, in, in the fast, deep water, deep. In the half light, dark. The fishing would be tragic. Tragic? Um, you know, uh, tragic might be an overstatement. Fishermen have been known to exaggerate from time to time, but tragic is a big word to throw into this context. He hasn't been particularly, uh, exaggerating before this. So why tragic? Why? What is in that dark area? What is in that deep area? that he doesn't want to face. Why? He doesn't. He turns away, he walks away. He did not want to go in, down the stream any further today. He's made some progress though, today. Meaning maybe sometime in the future. That's the key. That's the word today. He's come fishing to heal himself. Maybe He's come fishing, maybe even subconsciously, to get over something, to process a sense of loss, a sense of fear, a sense of devastation, 
sense of horror. He's come fishing to get over that. But he knows his limits. He knows, I've come this far, I've seen this much, I've had some thoughts along the way, I've kept steady in the face of those thoughts. But I'm not going to go that far. Not today. Maybe another time. I will come back. Maybe another time. Let this experience settle in. Let this experience bathe over me, wash over me. He's in the water. It's a kind of baptism if you want to go there. But let me get through it. Steady, deliberate, not talking. Nick stood up on the log, holding his rod. His landing net landed heavy, then stepped into the water and splashed ashore. He climbed the bank and put up and cut up into the woods toward the high ground. He was going back to camp. He looked back. The river just showed through the trees. There were plenty of days coming when he could fish the swamp. There are plenty of days coming when he could fish the swamp. That nails it. Beginnings and endings. The final line, and Hemingway was known to really sweat over every word choice. The final line in this is, there were plenty of days coming when he could fish the swamp. He knows there are plenty of days, unlike everybody who he lost in the war or through other means. He knows he will be back. He knows he can have that faith that, okay, I survived my past. But I can move into the future. This is, this is part of Hemingway's modernism. He's processing the past. He's dealing with the past, but he's trying to leave it behind. He writes in the present tense, always. There's very little uh, dwelling on the past in Hemingway. In this story, he is tortured by the past. It is weighing him down, but he's looking to the future. And he's doing so with a kind of hope, with a kind of fatalism, knowing it's going to be hard. It might be tragic, but he's still looking to the future. That in itself is hopeful. He's not being crushed, or at least like the trout in the stream He's facing it and trying to hold his ground. Hemingway in this story is a story of a man who is suffering. And you can critique that from a million different angles. But the suffering is identifiable. The suffering is human. He is not the big invulnerable macho man uh, going and watching bullfights and, you know, going on safari. He is somebody who feels loss. He is somebody who processes agony. He's not showy about it. He, uh, he is not somebody who is likely to go and talk an awful lot with other people but he does what he has to do to process it. And in the act of writing all of this, maybe he is sharing in the way he knows how. Maybe he is allowing other people by having such minimal expressive uh, uh, media, uh, such stripped down language, such stripped down characterization, such stripped down plot, it invites the reader in to come in and fill in all those blank spaces. And by doing so, 
you are providing a kind of therapy as well because then you are dragging your reader into your experience of processing pain and it becomes therapy honestly um the story is called big two-hearted river and there's probably a geographic reason for that uh related to the river and how it like flows or pools or something i don't know but this character has two hearts one is clearly suffering but the other is looking to the future hoping So, say what you want about Hemingway. And there's a lot to say. Um, he, he was a great artist. And he took modernism in a particularly personal and surprisingly intimate direction.